Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is good to see you today. I'll be sending the border collies out into the narthex momentarily to uh, round up the rest of the sheep. <laughs> For those who celebrate, happy Mother's Day. There are bouquets of chocolate flowers in the narthex. Um, Take, take some as you're leaving to give to people or for yourself uh, to celebrate. If this is something you don't celebrate, have a good regular day. Um, it is graduation season. There are notes in the bulletin, but I'm going to remind everybody, if you uh, have a graduate in your family, somebody who is graduating from college or high school this year, or last year, I understand 2020 just kind of didn't happen in many ways. And if we had graduates, they might, we might have missed recognizing them. So we're looking for last year's graduates and this year's graduates. And what we're going to do, what we're hoping to do is have a slideshow for a couple weeks. So if, if you're a graduate or if you've got a graduate, email a picture to the church office and if the graduate can just write a couple sentences about where they're headed next, what their plans are, um, something about a memory from St. James or anything they would like to share uh, as part of this recognition, then we will put that together and um, have that running before worship for a couple weeks. Uh, Randy, where did Randy get to? Okay, there's an update from Mission, so we're going to call on Randy to do that. Thank you, Randy. The uh, outreach to people who have so many needs is, is a wonderful thing. So hopefully we will get back into the pattern of doing that again.
As we gather together, we're going to be using part of Psalm 98, which fits so beautifully with what we just heard. Sing a new song to the Lord. He has done wonderful things. By his own power and holy strength, he has won the victory. Sing for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Praise him with songs and shouts of joy. Sing praises to the Lord. Play music on the harps. Blow trumpets and horns and shout for joy to the Lord our King. Roar, sea, and every creature in you. Sing, earth, and all who live on you. Clap your hands, you rivers, you hills. Sing together with joy before the Lord. The Lord comes to rule the earth. He will rule the peoples of the world with justice and fairness. Praise the Lord. definitely got a theme of joy going on here today and it's one of these things where 
the, the music gets picked and the readings get picked and somehow it all just comes together. And I love when that happens um, because, you know, I, I didn't particularly, I mean, I do tell, I do tell Beth, you know, what, what the choice of the readings are from the lectionary. But in terms of what I end up writing for the service, it just, it works. And that's always so much fun when I see that happening. So we have joy because we are here, because it is the day the Lord has made, and we're together. And that's wonderful. As a church, as a family, we approach God week after week, and hopefully we also do it as individuals day after day, because we have great intentions. But yet, in spite of our best intentions, we fall short of being what we've been created to be, what we've committed ourselves to be, to be disciples and live out God's kingdom. So let us take this opportunity to confess our sins before God and before one another. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess that we do not have you all figured out, but we act as if we do. We do not wait with patience for your words of wisdom and direction. We fail to separate our desire for power, our desire to make the rules, and our desire to speak for you from your calling on our lives. Have mercy on us for clinging to our own concept of the way things should be and for failing to hear your fresh alternatives. Turn our world upside down, O oh God, and teach us to trust in you above all else. Amen. God is merciful to all who trust in him. So our hearts need not be troubled because there is forgiveness. Hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever world without end. Amen. And because we have forgiveness, because God is there for us day after day and week after week, it brings peace. Peace that we have with ourselves and with God and to be shared with one another. If you're worshiping with us at home, if you've got people in the room with you, give them a big old hug and share Christ's peace. If you're watching this and there isn't anybody else in the room with you, know that we are with you in spirit and we wish you God's peace as well. But for those who are here, let's take a moment and share God's peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As we prepare to consider God's word for us this morning, let's pray together. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may your Holy Spirit rest upon us. May we hear what we need to hear, speak what you want us to say, and honor you in our believing and our living. Amen. Our first reading comes from the first letter of John in chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus has been born of God and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God 
when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. The word of the Lord. So over here on the screen, we've got a picture of an old guy. <laughs> Lived about 250 years ago. This is Johann Sebastian Bach. And he is a prime example of one of the greatest gifts that God gives to people. And that's the gift of music. I'm a music geek, so, you know, I, I especially appreciate that gift. Bach was one of the greatest composers who ever lived. Some of his music is still in our hymnals today. Now, the other thing you see on the screen is a little snippet from the bottom of one of his ma still existing manuscripts. And you'll notice there's some, fancy, there's some fancy script there. Every time Bach wrote music, down at the bottom where he signed it, he also put the letters S-D-G. And those, that's shorthand for a Latin expression, soli deo gloria, which means to God alone be the glory. Bach had a very deep sense that his musical talent had been a gift from God. And through his entire life, he wanted to use this gift to give God glory. And that gift continues even down to our worship today. Music in our tradition has been a very important part of worship. And just the fact that we're starting to be able to sing a little bit again behind our mask just makes me happy. In the Psalms, as you saw with our call to worship, there are a lot of references to music. I mean, that was kind of their hymnal. And probably most of those in the original Hebrew would have been set to music and sung as part of parades or worship experiences. And um, Psalm 98 is just so brimful of, of music and joy. It says, sing praises to the Lord, play music on the harps, blow trumpets and horns, shout for joy to the Lord. Pianos and organs hadn't been invented when this was written nor guitars, nor drums, but those would be in there. Well, they did have drums, but they're different than the ones we have. But those instruments would all be in there, too, if, if they had existed. The very last verse of the very last psalm, number 150, says, Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. So I think that means God really wants us to sing. Over the years, I've noticed that some people come to worship and they just sit there. They don't sing. Sad face. Um, they have lots of excuses for why they don't sing. And I've heard, you know, repeatedly over the years, well, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. Hmm, now that excuse doesn't hold water. The Bible doesn't say sing to the Lord with perfect pitch or a beautiful voice. It says make a joyful noise. To the Lord. Some people say, I don't like the songs we sing. And that excuse doesn't work either because the songs we sing aren't for us, they're for God. And since God created the gift of music, I'm guessing He probably likes all kinds of music. Some people will say, Well, I don't know that song. Our psalm this morning said, sing a new song to the Lord. Now, if we can't try to learn a new song, then we can't sing a new song to the Lord. So, and, and just think about it. Every single song was new at some point. So we need to all jump in. Um, obviously, where we are right now with getting past the pandemic and all, 
With the mask, we're still going to be singing quietly. But in your head, sing really, really loud. Because that's a gift that God has given us, to give God the glory. Just like Bach said, soli deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the gift of music. May we always have a song in our hearts, and may we sing praises to you. Amen. As the quick I feel like I'm at camp. This is wonderful. (laughs) 
Our second reading comes from the 10th chapter of Acts. It's short, so I'm probably going to hit it again during the course of the sermon. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider what you have to say to us this morning, let my words be your words, and let our thoughts be your thoughts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so once again, the lectionary has presented us with a single scene that is obviously at the end of a longer story, and it really needs some background so that we can understand it. I think I've mentioned at some point we should probably call the book of Acts the Acts of the Holy Spirit instead of the Acts of the Apostles. And today's reading is another example of this. The Holy Spirit is working on a whole bunch of different people all at the same time. So if we go back to the beginning of chapter 10, it starts by introducing the reader to Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman army officer. He lives in the town of Caesarea. And unlike most of the Romans, he and his whole family believe in God. He prays often. He gives generously to the poor. So one afternoon, Cornelius has a vision of an angel of God. Now, at first, this kind of scares the bejeebers out of him, but the angel reassures him, it's okay, God has heard your prayers. He has seen how you help the poor. And so now you need to send some of your folks to Joppa, find Simon Peter, this is where he's going to be, and invite him to come visit you. So Cornelius sends three of his men to Joppa to look for Peter. Next day, around noon, as these men are traveling to Joppa, Peter's praying, and he has a vision. Three times this happens. The heaven opens, and this thing that looks like a big sheet gets lowered down in front of him. And it's all full of all kinds of animals. Animals, um, reptiles, birds, all kinds of critters. And Peter hears a voice that says, get up, Peter. It's lunchtime. Eat. And Peter looks at these animals and says, mm, no way, Lord. These animals are unclean. You know I've always kept kosher. But the voice tells him, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. Three times this happens. You get the idea that Peter's a slow learner because back in John, it was the same thing. When Jesus was talking to Peter, he said, Simon Peter, do you love me? Three times. <laughs> Feed my sheep, tend my lambs, and so forth. So three times this thing comes down, and, and Peter's like, I can't eat that stuff. And, and the voice tells him otherwise. So Peter's kind of scratching his head and trying to figure out what this vision means. And right then, Cornelius' men show up. And the Holy Spirit says to Peter, there are three guys downstairs looking for you. Get up. Go down there and go with them without hesitation. I have sent them. So Peter goes down and he sees these men and he says, I'm the one you're looking for. What's up? And so they tell him all about the vision that Cornelius has had and how the angel told Cornelius to send for Peter so that Peter could come to his house and then Cornelius would hear what Peter had to say. So Peter invited these three fellows in and asked them to stay overnight before they make the return trip. And the next day, Peter goes with them from Joppa to Caesarea. And some of the other Jewish Christians in Joppa come along to see what's going to happen. They get there, and Cornelius is waiting for them. 
and he's called together his relatives and close friends. So there's this big group of people. Peter comes in the house and sees them, and he says, well, you all know it's against Jewish law for a Jew to associate with or, or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came right away. So why did you send for me? And Cornelius goes into detail and tells Peter all about this vision and says, I sent for you immediately and you've been kind enough to come. So now all of us here in the presence of God are here to listen to whatever the Lord has commanded you to say. And Peter says, wow, I get it now. God has shown me that he does not play favorites. In every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So he starts telling them about Jesus and explaining how all the prophets testify about Jesus that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And then that's where our reading picks up. Because Peter never even got to finish what he was going to say. Because then the next thing that happens, it says, while Peter's still speaking, the Holy Spirit comes on all of these people. And the people who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out, even on the Gentiles. They saw it. They heard it. They were speaking in tongues. They were praising God. They were celebrating. Peter says, can anybody withhold water for baptizing? And then Cornelius invited Peter and his friends to stay for several days. So in the church where I grew up in the 1960s, there was a pattern. There was kind of an unspoken sequence about how introduction to life in the church worked. And this will probably sound familiar to to all of you as well. And it really didn't matter what your denomination was. The process was pretty similar. If you were new in a town, you looked around, you found a church. And after you attended for a while, you went to the new members class. And there, you made sure you understood whatever it was that the Methodists or Catholics or UCCs or Presbyterians or whoever they were, what they believed. And at the end of this class, you said, yep, you believe it too. And then in the meantime, you were learning the written and unwritten community rules of how to behave. People here dress this way, we don't dress that way. Um, we stand here, we kneel there, we have responses, these are responses, and we say them here and here and so forth. Um, we favor this sort of music, this is how we act, and so on and so on. And then finally, you joined. You became a member. And at that point, you officially belonged. Or if you were a kid who grew up in that church, like me, you had years of instruction where you gradually absorbed these things, ending with a confirmation class and officially joining the church. Either way, you could say the sequence went, you believe, you behave, and then you belong. And that was kind of the pattern. It's how things worked back then, and uh, I'll bet that sounds pretty familiar to everybody. But the funny thing is, when you look at how Jesus worked, you realize he didn't follow that sequence at all. When he called the first disciples, he started by saying, follow me. They belonged to him before they knew who he was or what they believed about him. And after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit continued this reversal of normal expectations. Let's think about where Peter was coming from for a moment. His concept of things being done decently and in order, as we Presbyterians like to say, with respect to Gentile converts to Christianity, his scheme probably went something like this. Well, they would essentially have to become Jewish first. They would learn about Judaism. They would learn the behaviors associated with Jewish faith. 
change their diets and keep kosher, learn all the purification rites and all of the law and the Torah, and then profess their belief in God and their faith in Jesus as Lord and Son of God. Then they would be baptized in water as a sign and seal of this new identity they were accepting. And then finally, as happened on Pentecost, they would receive the Holy Spirit and they would be filled with the very presence of Christ. At least that's how Peter would have figured it was supposed to happen. Poor Peter, can you imagine? As a disciple and as one of the leaders of, in the Jerusalem headquarters of this new Jewish sect of Jesus followers, he hears the voice of God calling him to go into the home of a Roman centurion in the city of Caesarea. Caesarea was the Roman capital of Judea. It was a symbol of Gentile occupation and oppression and power. Not only is it improper for a Jew to go into the home of a Gentile or eat with them or be in any kind of community with them, this particular Gentile was a commander in the occupying army. Peter does not know what to think, but he obeys the voice. And he invites Cornelius' men, all of whom would have been Gentiles, to stay overnight before they go on their way. This would have been unheard of. He goes to Cornelius' house the next day. This is probably the first time in his life he has ever set foot inside the house of a Gentile. And he begins to teach these gathered outsiders about Jesus. And just as Peter is starting this process, just as he begins the introduction of these Roman Gentiles to the word about Jesus, you might say that all heaven broke loose. Because the spirit of Christ just rudely interrupts and bam, willy-nilly starts baptizing all of these Gentiles with the Holy Spirit. Peter must have been thinking, hang on a minute. That's supposed to be the final step in the process, right? But here they are. They're speaking in tongues. They're prophesying. They're praising God. It's abundantly clear that they have been adopted and filled and blessed by God. Peter looks at this and realizes that God is doing a new thing. And you think, wow, he's sort of like a pilot trying to learn to fly the plane while it's already in the air. He says, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have already received the Holy Spirit? So the people get baptized. The Spirit is turning all of Peter's presuppositions on their heads the spear is breaking barriers all over the place. And the story makes it really plain that God's going to do what God wants to do and that human concepts of boundaries and norms and practices will not control who gets to be part of the community. Peter's companions are shocked. We read, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. And the word even just says it all. The unthinkable has happened. Even the Gentiles can be heirs of the gospel. The Jewish believers don't have a monopoly on Jesus. Of all the stories in Acts, where the Holy Spirit comes on people, this is the only time when the gift of the Spirit comes before the people are baptized with water. Maybe the Spirit was choosing to be more dramatic here in order to really drive home the point to the new church. The Holy Spirit was working among these early Christians to change their preconceived notions of who's in and who's out. And the boundaries just keep widening. 
to the point where it seems like there really aren't boundaries. Kind of reminds us of Jesus telling the disciples just before he ascended into heaven that they were going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it also nudges us to let go of our own preconceptions of who we think is in or should be in and who we think is or should be out and see that God works in the lives even of those who seem to be so different from us. But obviously he loves them just as much. The end of the story, we read that Cornelius invited Peter and friends to stay with him for several days and apparently they did again groundbreaking new territory this just would not have happened before and we think oh great happy ending right well the story continues in chapter 11 and in the Jerusalem church there's a bit of a kerfluffle over this because the rest of the church leaders in Jerusalem needed to be convinced that this thing was really for real. They called Peter to task, not because the Gentiles had been baptized, but because he stayed in their house and ate their food. He socialized with uncircumcised people, Gentiles. And so Peter had to recount the entire story to them with support from the six people who had come with him. It took that before the leaders of the Jerusalem church were convinced. And Peter had to say to them, if God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when the church leaders heard this, they finally accepted that God intended to expand the community of faith to include Gentiles. This was a huge turnaround. It called into question so much of what these leaders thought had been written in stone for centuries. And it took them a few more years to figure out exactly how they wanted to handle it. There was some ongoing controversy. You know, do we require circumcision? Do we require observance of the dietary laws? How do we deal with this influx of people who are different from what we are? And eventually, there were some modified requirements, but they accepted that you didn't have to become Jewish in order to be a Christian. But it must have been just mind-blowing for them. If God has broken the rules, God has started treating the impure people the same as the pure people, how could they be sure about anything? How are they going to know who they should still be excluding? Where are they going to draw the lines now? I think it would be a mistake for us to look at this story as merely a nice bit of church history. I mean, we can say, well, sure, after all, nobody at this point is debating whether you have to become Jewish in order to be a Christian. That's been settled. But in every generation, similar arguments have raised their ugly heads as people in the church have insisted that they can read God's mind about who is in and who is out, who is pure, who is not pure. In every generation, factions in Christianity have had the idea that God wants them to promote their definition of purity in the church, to be, avoid being contaminated by outsiders or people who are different. Think of all the artificial walls we've built in the church over the years with our perceptions of us and them. Think how that extends out into society with all of the us versus them mentality going on. Unfortunately, as we've seen, it's often related to race. In our own time, we can see numerous hate groups 
white supremacist hate groups. And they put the word Christian in their name, but not in their actions. And think of all the debates that have occurred in the church just over the last half century or so. Can divorced people still be part of the Christian community? Do we ordain women? Do we accept marriage between people of different races? Do we accept marriage between Protestants and Catholics? Can homosexual people be part of a faith community? Can we ordain them? Can they get married to each other? Peter realized that God was choosing to do a new thing. And his role was to honor what God was doing and not to draw lines and boundaries around what he thought God should or should not do. Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And just as Peter discovered that he could not second guess how God and the Holy Spirit were going to choose to work, we can't either. You've probably heard the expression, my mom used it a lot. My mom used to say, God works in mysterious ways. And she was right. And thanks be to God for surprising us. Over the next few weeks approaching and, and going beyond Pentecost with the emphasis being on the action of the Holy Spirit, we will be using as our affirmation of faith part of the Presbyterian Brief Statement of Faith from 1982. Um, they say it's brief, but there's no way we could do the whole thing in uh, this particular spot in a service but we'll be using the part of it that does talk about the Holy Spirit. So let's affirm our faith together. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, 
whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church, with believers in every time and place. We rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we get ready to enter our time of prayer together, some things to keep on our hearts. We'll continue to pray for Beth as she's working through her issues that good days will exceed rough days. We give thanks that Melissa is continuing to improve we give thanks. Jean is here. Her surgery went great. It's reduced her pain, and it did what it was supposed to do. So that is very exciting. This week, the Kuhn family and the Lang family are our prayer families. So reach out to them. Let them know we prayed for them today. Um, let them know that we are sending them hugs and uh, God's love as well. As you heard from Randy, we are still out there, getting back out there, doing mission, doing work in the community, for the community, on behalf of God. So make sure that everybody is current with our pledges, our tithes, our offerings, so that this work can continue. Let us pray and dedicate those gifts. Dear God, your gifts to us are so many. Let us always use them for your glory, like Bach used his music. Give us cheerful hearts to give back to your work from the gifts that you have given us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for calling us to be your church, for us to be the building you've made without hands, and for all the gifts that you give us to build up the body of Christ and carry out your mission. Help us to use all of these gifts well. We thank you for the unconditional love that we receive from you which Jesus showed in his willingness to call us friends and then lay down his life for us. Many of us have seen a human manifestation of Christ-like love in our mothers, and we thank you for them. We thank you for their sacrifices of time and personal freedoms. We're grateful for the sleepless nights they endured on our behalf and their caring compassion in times of illness or sorrow. We thank you for those who taught us the faith and shared with us the stories of Jesus. We thank you for the work they did that helped to mold our character and teach us to respect others and to love you. We ask you to bless our mothers, to pour out your spirit of grace on them, to grant them strength and peace. And we thank you for all the other people in our lives who've been like mothers to us, whose love and strength have helped us grow. For those for whom Mother's Day brings up feelings of sorrow and grief over what never was or what might have been, we ask for comfort. For those who experience the pain of neglect or abuse, we pray for healing and the grace to forgive. May they find others who will mother them and show them your love. We thank you that you are present to each of us, whether our mothers are near or far, present or gone, and that in you we can find the perfect love and obedience that we desire so much. Loving God, we pray for those who are mothers of growing children, 
give them more energy than the small ones and wisdom enough to guide the older ones. Give them patience in conflict, sensitivity in matters of the heart, and sound judgment as they prepare their children for the future. We lift Melissa to you with prayers for continued strength and patience as she goes through the rehab process. We pray for Beth that the good days will outnumber the rough days and that she will always feel your love and support and our care for her. We rejoice and give you thanks that Jean's surgery went well and that she's gotten relief from the pain. We pray that her recovery will continue to be speedy and uneventful. And we lift to you the Keem family and the Lang family, and we thank you for your care for them. In this time of quiet with you, we lift to you the joys and concerns we hold in our hearts, but don't speak aloud. Lord, you know what we need before we even ask. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so go out into the world in peace. Know that God goes with you. Be open to God's surprises because you never know what the Holy Spirit might be up to. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. <laughs>